We are going to continue through our series in Jeremiah this week, hitting just a few high points. And so today we're going to continue with that. We're actually going to read two separate sections uh, that are bound together uh, but are in different places. And so if you want to put a, a ribbon in your Bible or open a couple of browser tabs or whatever you need to do, we're going to be in uh, Jeremiah 31 to start and then also Jeremiah 33 uh, as, we, as we move on. So I was a senior in high school in 2001, and I was uh, just beginning the school year. Uh, we'd had our first football game, but not yet our second football game, and so my mind as senior uh, seniors in high school tend to be was in completely other places. Uh, I was not terribly worried about school or my grades. I was worried about the football game coming up that week. I was uh, worried about social things. I was worried about everything except for global politics, right? I was not terribly worried about that. And then uh, one of my friends came up to me, and as I was sitting, uh, standing at my locker getting ready to go into government class, uh, the, the government teacher's daughter came in and told me, hey, somebody uh, flew a plane into a, a building in New York. And me, being extremely naive and extremely ignorant, the first thing I thought was, sure, a Piper Cub running into a tower in, in New York, that probably happens all the time, doesn't it? And I wasn't terribly worried yet. And then I walked in and was standing there in government class. And the teacher already had a TV on. And we were watching this broadcast of this absolutely horrific event, right? Now, I bring that up for a couple of reasons. First of all, because the 20th anniversary is coming up on Saturday. And so I know, I know it's in a lot of people's minds already. Uh, thinking about where we are now versus where we were 20 years ago, thinking about things that are different, thinking about things that are the same. But for me, as I look back 20 years ago, all I remember is the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach when I realized I did not live where I thought I lived. When I realized the world around me was not what I thought it was up to that point. I had lived for so long in an extremely safe, in extremely sheltered environment. I'm 37 years old right now, and all four of my grandparents, my biological grandparents, are still living. Both of my parents are relatively healthy. Both of my siblings are relatively healthy. I had an extremely sheltered childhood when it comes to issues of death and when it comes to issues of safety. And so when I walked into government class that morning, 20 years ago this Saturday, my whole world completely changed. Who I was before and who I was after were fundamentally different because I understood the world in a different way. I thought the world was a very different place than it had turned out to be. And so I know for a while, I, like many people, was scared. That was one of my first responses was just to be scared. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen to me? What should my responsibility be in this? And after scared, then I just went from that to looking for where's the good? Where is the good in what is going on right now, because I don't see a lot of good. I see a lot of bad. I see a lot of problems. I see a lot of difficulties. I see a lot of anger. I see a lot of hatred, but I don't see a lot of hope in this situation. And I was looking around desperate, desperate to find hope in a desperate situation. And I'll be honest, I didn't find it right away. This was difficult for me for a long, long time. And even looking around now, we talked last week about the experience of being a people in exile, 
of looking around at all the ways that we know to be Christian, all the ways that we know to be the people of God, all the ways that we know to be the church, and it's fundamentally changing. It's different. It's not the same. There is a sense of loss, a sense of abandonment even, a sense of looking around and saying, okay, God, I know I know that you have the ability to bring good out of this. I know that you can redeem all things. I know that in the end you will redeem all things. But where in this is the hope? Jeremiah is a painful, painful book to read. If you've ever tried to sit down and read all the way through the book of Jeremiah, you will learn a couple of things very quickly. First, the person that Uh, put the book of Jeremiah together, whether it was Baruch or whoever it was, Jeremiah's secretary, whoever put Jeremiah together was not worried about a coherent narrative. There is no story in Jeremiah. There are oracles and prophecies. There is lament and there is pain and there is weeping. And occasionally there are these moments like in this section Where God, through Jeremiah, gives the people of Judah hope. So we're going to go ahead and read these passages to start out with. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of historical context. Here is what was going on. Here is what this meant to those people. And then we're going to talk about where Jeremiah found hope in this desperate situation. So we're going to start with Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. And remember their sin no more. Now we're going to move forward to Jeremiah 33. Starting with verse 14. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to make grain offerings and to make sacrifices for all time. May God bless the reading and hearing of just a portion of God's word. I want you to notice a couple of things about this passage. Remember that this was written primarily to the nation of Judah. This was written to the people of God who were about to be taken into exile. Last week we were reading to the people of God who were in exile. This is to the people of God who were about to, to be taken into exile. And we know, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. We know that they were going to be in exile for 70 years. And we know that they were going to stay there in this desperate circumstance and that they had been called by God to be in exile, God's people, to endure with patient, (laughs) long-suffering, the exile to which they were called. But notice that this is not written just to Judah. This is written to Judah and 
Israel. Now we tend to think of Israel as one nation, but it was not often a united kingdom. It was often a divided kingdom. And the kingdom of Judah was the southern kingdom. The kingdom of Israel was the northern kingdom. And I want you to note that at this point in history, when Jeremiah is speaking to these people, the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, had not existed for a hundred years. It had already been taken into exile. It did not functionally exist at this point. And so when Jeremiah says, when Jeremiah says, the days are surely coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, he was not just speaking to the people who were about to go into exile. He was speaking to a group of people that had been decimated and did not functionally exist as a nation anymore. Why is that important? That is important because this is, again, fundamentally a message of hope. First of all, it was a message of hope that the people of God had not been forgotten. Hope that they had not been forgotten. God wasn't just talking to the people who were about to go into exile. He was telling the people who were about to go into exile, I will make a new covenant even with the people who have been gone for a hundred years. You may think that they have been forgotten. You may think that because they have been wiped out, because their nation has been destroyed, you may think because of what happened to them that they have been forgotten. I want you to know that I have not forgotten them. And in the same way, I will not forget you. God was telling the people of Judah who were about to go into exile, you are not forgotten. The people of Israel have not been forgotten, and neither of you. Jeremiah was telling them, have hope that you will not be forgotten. Jeremiah was also telling them to have hope that they would be forgiven. Hope that they would be forgiven. Now, this is something that is kind of difficult for us to imagine. Most of us have grown up, or at least later in life, come to a solid understanding of the forgiveness of God. That if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We so sing songs about our sins being removed from us as far as the east is from the West, and although we may still occasionally feel guilt, we still may occasionally carry the shame of our sin. That's not because of how God relates to us. That's because of our own baggage and our own issues. God's forgiveness, we know and we understand that God's forgiveness is complete, unconditional. When we ask God, we can be forgiven. And that wasn't necessarily a common understanding at the time. They were still used to, in this day and age, they were used to the sacrificial system. They were used to the day of atonement. They were used to bringing animals into the temple. They were used to this sacrifice. And what was going to happen when they were taken out of Jerusalem? when they were taken away from the temple, when they were going to end up in Babylon, how then would they be forgiven? If we cannot go to the temple, if we cannot offer sacrifices, if we cannot follow Torah, if we cannot offer the sacrifices of Leviticus 17 and the Day of Atonement, if we cannot put our sins on the head of this animal, if there is no sacrifice, what happens to us? And God says, you will be forgiven. And your sins will be remembered no more. Verse 34, Jeremiah 31, 34. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin 
no more. We might just rush past that because we believe that our sins have been forgiven. And so it's almost this trite thing. Well, yeah, of course their sins are going to be forgiven. Of course God forgives iniquity. Of course God is going to remember their sin no more. But that was not, that was not automatic to them. That was not automatically their understanding. And so Jeremiah is giving them hope that they're going to be not going to be forgotten and they are going to be forgiven. Jeremiah is giving them hope. Jeremiah also gives them hope that they are going to have a relationship with God. Each individual person is going to have the opportunity to have a relationship with God. There's this really, really interesting phrase that's one of my, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and it's one of those, again, that we become so familiar with that we don't necessarily hear what was being said to the first people. Here, still in Jeremiah 31, verse 33, God says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. I will be their God, and they will be my people. We talk about writing God's law on our hearts. And usually what we mean by that is memorizing God's word. And I think that memorizing God's word is a good and wonderful thing. And I think that if we, more of us, did more of that, then we would be better equipped to handle more things in life. But I don't think that's first and foremost what was meant to the people here. We're going to go uh, in depth into some uh, ancient Near Eastern religious practices, and it's going to get weird for just a minute, okay? But stick with me. Stick with me. We've heard about people reading tea leaves, right? They want to know what's going to happen in the future. They might read tea leaves. We've heard about uh, people who might use other kinds of means to try to figure out what God is doing in the world. Maybe looking at the stars and the movement of the stars. Maybe looking at how these things rotate. Maybe looking at where, where, what the stars are saying and how they're aligned to try to say, okay, this is what God is saying or this is what the, God, <laughs> the gods are saying. In the ancient Near East, they had a practice called extapacy. And the practice of extapacy is that during a sacrifice, they would take one of the organs of the animal, whatever animal was sacrificed, and they would look for certain lines. They would look for certain spots. They would look for certain messages within the organs of the animals. And they would look back at their historical records and say, okay, last time we saw this line in the heart of this goat from this sacrifice— of this liver, from this bull, from this sacrifice. Last time we saw that, there was a massive earthquake. And so we might be looking for an earthquake. We might be looking for a natural disaster. We might be looking for one of these kinds of things. And the whole purpose was people were trying to find order. People were trying to find understanding. People wanted to know what God wanted from them. And in a world where they couldn't go and look at their personal Bible, in a world where they could not just pray to God and believe that God heard them, in a place where they had to wait to go to the temple to hear the words of God read, in a place and time when they had to wait and have someone else intercede between them and God, when they had to wait on priests, they were told, I will put my law in you and my words will be inscribed on your hearts. I will be your God and you will be my people. At a place in a time when your relationship with God had to be funneled through other things or other people, your relationship with God had to go through the priests, your relationship with God had to go through the temple, your relationship with God had to go through Torah. There was always some kind of intermediary. And so this 
hope that Jeremiah gave them, this hope that God gave them through Jeremiah was that God's word would be written on their hearts, inside of them. That God would be their God and they would be God's people. They were given hope that they would be able to have a real relationship as individual people with God. And they were given hope that their exile would not last forever. This second passage we read in chapter 33 is famous to us because of its fulfillment in Christ. But remember the first people to whom it was written, for them it was talking about the end of exile. They were going to be taken into a nation where they had no means of sacrifice, no means of prayer. They had no way of ruling over themselves. They had no way of taking care of their own business. They were doing what other people told them to do. They were at the mercy of Babylon, and they were going to be at the mercy of Babylon for decades. And when you are going through a situation that just continues to go on, those of you who have dealt with grief after the loss of a loved one, those of you who have dealt with chronic pain, those of you who have dealt with chronic illness, those of you who have dealt with, with difficulties with family or loved ones, know that sometimes when you are going through this pain, when you are going through this difficulty, sometimes it is difficult to see the end of it. You believe that there's going to be an end. You believe that there's going to be a resolution, but you just can't see it. And there are days and there are times when it may feel like there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Or maybe there is a light at the end of a tunnel and it's a train coming straight for you. When they were staring down the barrel of 70 years in exile, not knowing, hoping, but not knowing that it was going to end, Jeremiah tells them, you will not always be here. This is not the end of your story. Jeremiah gave them hope that they would not always be in exile. And each of these hopes was fulfilled for the people to whom they were written. They were fulfilled 70 years later when the people of God were brought out of Israel they were fulfilled 70 years later when they were able to enter back into Israel. They were able to enter into Judah when they were able to reestablish their sacrifice, when they were able to reestablish their kingship, when they were able to govern themselves, when they were able to worship in the temple. It was fulfilled then. But we also see this fulfilled in Christ. Many hundreds of years after this, we see our God not forgetting us. We see God forgiving us. We see our relationship with God expanded, and we see a return from exile in the life, in the ministry, in the person, in the death, in the resurrection of Jesus. We too are not forgotten. In the first century in Israel, they were dealing with a difficult situation where, again, they were under the thumb of another foreign government, and God was telling them, you are not forgotten. God sent them Jesus, sent Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and their sins as well. We see the fulfillment in Jesus. But I think there is still a fulfillment out there. I think there is still fulfillment past Jesus in us and through us. There is still a fulfillment of this in eternity. God spoke to Jeremiah and Jeremiah spoke to the people of God. And Jeremiah speaks to us telling us, you are not forgotten. It has been 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth. It has been 2,000 years since 
the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It has been 2,000 years, and it's been up and down. There have been peaks and troughs. There have been great moments of triumph for humanity and for the church, and there have been moments of absolute desperation and despair. And God is telling us, you have not been forgotten. And you will be, you can be forgiven. I don't know where you all are this morning, what you brought into the service. Before we had worship rehearsal, we we talked a little bit, we prayed a little bit about the things that we bring in with us. Many of you are dealing with difficult health situations. Many of you are dealing with difficult family situations. Many of you are dealing with difficult personal situations. I don't know what you all are bringing in. I don't know what brokenness you are bringing with you, what sin you are bringing with you. I know what I'm bringing with me. But God has told us that we are not forgotten and that we can be forgiven. That we can be forgiven. If we ask. But that's only a beginning. The point is the relationship with God. Jeremiah gives us hope that we too can have a relationship with God. That is God's goal for you. Forgiveness is wonderful. Forgiveness is freeing. But that in and of itself is not the whole story. The whole story is the relationship that God wants to have with us. And Jeremiah gives us hope that we too can have a relationship with God. And Jeremiah gives us hope that we, too, might be brought out of exile. Now, I know your exile may look very different than mine. Whatever your estrangement from God looks like, whatever your difficulty with the people around you looks like, whatever your health situation, wherever you feel distant and separated from God and from the people of God, from yourself and from those around you. God has given us hope that we too might be brought out of that exile now and into eternity. So my invitation to you today, my invitation to you today is to put your hope in the Lord, to put your hope in God, hope that you are not forgotten Hope that you might be forgiven. Hope that you might have a relationship with God. Hope that your exile will not last forever. There are good people around us that we can lean on, but our hope and our trust is and ought to be in God and in God alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is not just a blind faith. This is a hope against hope. This is a trust that God will do what God has promised. A hope that God would fulfill God's promises to us and to bring us where God has called us to be. Romans 5, in Romans 5, Paul says we glory in our suffering. We glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope will not disappoint us. It is not fun to suffer. It is not something that we look for. It is not something that we seek. And yet God gives us hope even through the most difficult things that we go through. That suffering produces endurance. That endurance produces character. That character can produce in us godly hope that will not disappoint us. Would you all join me in prayer this morning? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for this day. 
We thank you for this chance that we have to gather in worship. We thank you for everyone who has gathered here today with us. God, we all are bringing our baggage. We are bringing our garbage. We are bringing all of our sin and our brokenness and our failings and our difficulties and our pain. And God, we lay it all at your feet today. We know that we don't have what it takes to stand up under it. And so we place it at your feet, knowing that even this, even this, you can redeem in our lives and you can produce something good out of it and you can bring us to hope in you. Hope that we won't be forgotten. Hope in forgiveness, hope in relationship, and hope in a return, a return to you. So God, we thank you, and we trust you, and we put our hope in you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you want to go ahead and uh, get out your elements, I've been told to remind you to open the bread first, because if you try to open the juice first, then you're going to have to hold it upside down. Uh, <laughs> when I was in junior high and high school, I went to Arthur Baptist Church, and there was something that we would do every time we took communion. Every time we took communion, um, we, would, we would repeat the words at the end. Uh, for when you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The pastor would allow us to repeat until he comes. Let this be a reminder for us today as we partake of the bread, as we partake of the cup, that our hope is out there. It may not be something that we see right now. It may not be something that we are experiencing right now, but our hope is out in front of us. In this life and in eternity. And let, us, let this be a reminder for us to proclaim the Lord's death, our hope, until he comes. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, broke it, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after eating, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the Lord's cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you all join me in prayer? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for what you have given for us. We thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for the opportunities that you have given us. We thank you for the hope that you have offered. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit in us and the opportunity that we have to be part of you, to participate in your life. God, we love you and we trust you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as a quick reminder, on Communion Sunday, uh, we also uh, have our fellowship offering. Fellowship offering is something uh, that we use to help those in our congregation who are experiencing need. And so this is a, a special offering that we take just for that. I believe Gene has a, uh, a yes, thank you, a tray. <laughs> I've done all the thinking of the right words that I can for one morning. Um, has a tray uh, right over here um, uh, as, as you're walking out, labeled fellowship offering, if you're looking to give for that. So, Now with that, would you all please stand as you're able as we close our worship and song today?
water you turn into wine you open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you there's none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you our god is greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome in power our god our God into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you our god is greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome in power our god our god and if our god is for us then who could ever stop us and if our god is with us then what could stand against and if our god is for us then who could ever stop us and if our god is with us then what could stand against Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power our god our god so may the love of god and the peace of christ and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you now and always as you put your hope in the lord go in peace